This is Power of the Streets, a podcast series brought to you by Human Rights Watch about how we speak truth to power. I'm Audrey Kawire Wabwire and I'm based in Nairobi, Kenya. So far in the season, we've been to Nigeria and Malawi to hear from some of the people driving Africa's Me Too movement. We have so many other countries to get to, but in this episode, we're taking the conversation to Uganda. Everyone we speak to in the series has a second, a minute, or an hour when they realize that they need to make a change. The moment when they decide to step up and rise. The world shocking me in in ways that, you know, I spent most of my university days running around as a journalist. I was working for a daily monitor, mm-hmm. one of the, you know, leading independent dailies in the country. Mm-hmm. So it uh, really, really opened my eyes at a very young age because, mm-hmm. you know, you're coming from secondary school. You don't know much about the world or even your country. That's Rosbel Kagumire. She is the curator and editor of the prominent blog African Feminism, which works with over 27 African feminists. The blog is just one of the ways she uses to organize and stand up for women's rights. Those were, I think, early seeds of awakening, of, I would say, at least to be concerned beyond my own, you know, be, beyond my own being, you know. I, I could tell, like, before I was aware of, of course, inequalities. I was aware of patriarchy, even if I didn't know the word. Mm-hmm. At least that, from the early age, you know, you know about that. But to be really quite aware of other people's inequalities beyond, even if you're women, even if you're girls, like you are not affected the same of other factors that affect other people. Mm-hmm. It was when I started, you know, being a journalist at a very young age. So let let's go back a bit to the beginning. You know, tell me about the moment when you began your activism? It's not a moment. I think it's a journey. Mm-hmm. So there's different moments, but overall I would call it a journey to arrive where you are at. Um, my background, you know, I'm a journalist by training. My first job for 10 years, I worked in Uganda newsrooms. Mm-hmm. So definitely I saw, and I started working as a journalist rather, you know, at a very young age, uh, at, a uni- at university. I hadn't even graduated. Mm. How old were you? 18, 19. But working there, like by the age of 20, I was covering, covering riots in mm-hmm. Kampala. Um, I was covering, you know, I was covering political parties. Then I was, you know, learning on the job, learning many things that I probably, my education would not have given me. Mm-hmm. So it really opened my eyes at a very young age to what was coming, what was going on in the country. But also opened my eyes in terms of like privilege mm-hmm. to understand, you know, even if I didn't know like the right words, maybe right now, like looking at feminist language, but I was quite aware at a young age about uh, the inequalities that inhabited my country. That's really interesting. And you're, you're speaking about some really heavy stuff. But let's go back to what you're saying um, about, you know, how you are beginning your your realization of, you know, how you know, different people are living in your country and you're reporting about this and learning at the same time. Do you think that it was this, just seeing these things that, you know, drove you to where you are today or is it something else? I remember a very pertinent issue. I I was an uh, intern in, a, in, uh, in the one of the newsroom, in the newsroom, you know, the Daily Monitor newsroom, and I didn't know uh, anybody. Oh, well, I had an uncle who worked in the same newsroom, but he's quite senior. So you you spend your days, of, of course, also figuring out things with your colleagues and con- making your own connections. Mm-hmm. And uh, so one of the editors, senior editors, came to me and said, oh, you know, because I was at school, I would send in stories and sometimes I have to come the next day. There was no internet much connections at the mm-hmm. time. So he he was like, oh, you know, I need your phone number and your email uh, in case when you send stories, I have some questions. This was a sub-editor, mm-hmm. you know. I'm like, oh, all right. I give them to him. Like, we were in the same flow of the newsroom. Mm-hmm. And I think within like 30 minutes, I was seated on a certain spot and my and the phone, uh, my phone rang. No, no, the like the, the intercom uh, rang. Then I pick it. It's like, who is it? You know, and somebody doesn't talk, you know. 
I'm like, that's strange. Okay, anyways, it's an office phone. Mm. So I I go. I had my first phone. My uncle had bought me uh, a Siemens little yeah. small phone, yes. you know. And <laughs> uncle of mine that. had given it to me because I could not afford anything mm. like a phone at that point. Um, so my phone rings. Then someone is like, oh, do you know who this is? So my feeling is that at the time, very few people had a phone. So I thought it was one of my friends. Maybe they, we were in holidays and maybe they are... They are teasing me. I'm like, uh, you know, I'm going to hang up if you don't tell me who you are. So he told me it was the editor. I'd just given my phone. We're in the same newsroom. He's calling me. Can you imagine? And I was mad. I just hung up. So um, then I went, I think a few more minutes, uh, a few minutes later, I go into my inbox, you know. I find in my email, I find an, an email from him. Mm-hmm. He's like, oh, you're so beautiful. Can you imagine? Uh, oh, my God. Just my five bl- minutes later. He had sent, I think, the email before. So I went into my inbox and read. I was so mad. My ah, blood was boiling. I can imagine <laughs> that. That's awful. And and I was like, what do I do to this situation? <laughs> so anyways, I, I'm that strong-willed. Like, yeah. I just immediately responded to him and told him I'm not here for a beauty show. You should see the email when I read his letter. I was like, oh my God, I'm so, so daring. <laughs> I can't even imagine 18 years old. I'm telling this man who's probably like 45 or yeah. Or 40 I'm like I'm not here for a beauty show yes. and I don't care your opinion of hey, my looks go Things you, like that, yes. you know? I'm like <laughs> I'm like I give you my number for professional purposes I don't mm-hmm. think that and I told him to act his age it Ooh. was such a <laughs> takedown <laughs> oh my goodness oh my yeah it was a proper takedown you know wow. so I send it. I was mad. <laughs> then I walk around. I think in the evening, when I ask one, I, we were sent out for an assignment. I go and ask a friend of mine who was a photographer, a very nice person, guy. I ask him, what exactly does this guy do? What is his powers? So <laughs> after I send the email, <laughs> I start thinking about what act is going to happen to yeah. me. <laughs> Think about it later. Yeah. He was like, oh, uh, he da- this is what he lays actually he determines which stories go on which page and stuff. Mm. Like I'm finished. He's like, what happened? I'm like, something <laughs> happened. I I I just took him on, so I don't know if I'm gonna publish anything. Uh-huh. And he's like, okay, just just keep a distance and see how he reacts. Mm-hmm. But make sure you just know he has powers, like today oh. pages and stories. You can throw out your stories oh. and stuff. So I start panicking. Mm-hmm. Then I start. I call my uncle. <laughs> He was not in the newsroom. Uncle, I've messed up. Yeah, like I would not have. I'm a very independent person. Even if you are my relative in the same space, mm-hmm. uh, the chances of me coming to you with anything are zero. Yeah. So, but that was a very urgent matter. Like mm-hmm. I asked, I his phone was off actually. So I said I had, to, I had to send him, and I didn't know like he didn't tell me he was not around. So I learned later from the editor that my uncle had gone to cover some some out, out of out of town. You know, mm-hmm. he was there for a few days. So I start panic. I sent him an email describing the whole situation. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm so young. <laughs> I, I even forward him my response and the email. Uh-huh. I was like, okay. Uh, so so anyways, uh, he he's he replies and tells me, come down. There's no nothing is gonna happen to you. Good. And I'm coming back in a few days. Mm. I'll. I'll see how to handle this, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I don't know. Um, I think when he comes back, he kind of has a conversation with his senior colleagues about mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. I don't even know how the email ended up in that. another newspaper. <laughs> oh. Yes. So somehow there was, yeah, there was, something happened around this time. But he told me was, I think he's coding, like he shared, is like, we need to address this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I walked into the newsroom after this was published. They called a meeting and they talked about har- sexual harassment, about interns. Mm-hmm. There was like some uh, women who were senior journalists, editors. They said, we need a meeting. Mm-hmm. But I wasn't even in the, in the office. So I came from my school. I used to come like later because I had to attend school. When I reached the reception, everybody was looking at me funny. It was like, What's going on? Of course, I had not been the one who sent that. Like, I, you know, like, no. So that was for me the earliest. Anyway, they called me and asked me and, and told him, like, you cannot, mm-hmm. you know, this is it. But I could stand up for myself mm. and, uh, against somebody with that much power at the age of 18. Mm-hmm. So I think that you you can't really 
be an activist and stand up for people if you can't stand up for yourself it starts mm. with the self you know you can't otherwise i don't know like you can't hold it longer like you can't go on working longer if you have not done the inside job of standing up for yourself yes yes that that is so important i 100% agree and you know talking about the movement the me to movement in africa um this conversation was quickly followed by you know a discussion about marginalized workers in the humanitarian industry that's the subsequent aid to movement um which exposed sexual harassment sexual exploitation and just a general toxic working environment that women in particular are subjected to in the global aid sector and this sector is white um, male dominated you wrote a very personal reflection based on your experience in this tell us about it oh <laughs> yeah uh you know like how i've been talk about like um building consciousness around gender in my place in the world uh not uh an individual story but a story that is rooted in history and the systems that are around us mm-hmm. um i think that it was because of my studies around gender and that led me to understand that to understand racial politics and racism and how it manifests right mm-hmm. and so i went uh, i was invited to go um take part in a campaign and the campaign was on migrant rights and i was very passionate about at the time there was really a crisis happening Uh, along uh, across the Mediterranean, the Gulf of Aden, um people were many African young people on the move to Europe to to Middle East in millions, you know. Mm-hmm. Um so I I thought it was a very important platform mm-hmm. to really advocate and then that was at the time 2015, the rise of populism in Europe, mm-hmm. you know, anti-immigration, anti-blackness all coming go together. I thought, you know, this is a very good campaign. But then slowly the politics inside politics and the organization were not sustainable. There were not enough black people in the organization. Mm-hmm. Um it was totally like it was probably 80 something percent white. And I'd never been in a place like that in my whole world, you know. Um I don't think I was prepared for it, you know. Uh in and, and also when you go to a meeting and most people were heads of the, a white male middle-aged man who, you know, see themselves as experts on our countries and our lives. Mm-hmm. And as a very conscious African, it was a struggle. It was a struggle to bring myself to to this uh to these rooms, you know. D- did you feel like the expectation was just, you know, keep quiet just be grateful you're here of course mm. and once i was there there was one uh kenyan guy who was one of the heads of departments and this guy who actually hired me white called the only black man in management to kind of show me off like you know i've hired a black person that was the first red flag and it was like why are you excited to hire me as a black person like showing me off like mm. Yeah so it was really in small doses but to be on the system had no means of accountability if you were you were facing workplace harassment which i went through mm-hmm. bullying at work by that supervisor and it wasn't alone there was another kenyan guy there was a south sudanese uh, woman uh, in the same department who who joined later on who also left around the same time as me and went through horrible horrible episodes of violence from this person and there was no way where to report like even when the one of us reported nobody responded to them you know but also uh i came to that place as a consultant so you don't have many rights you understand in this space you're a black woman you're a consultant you're living in europe um you're far away from home you know uh so many vulnerabilities that i had never experienced in my life mm-hmm. and you don't have security of job because you're a consultant this same person um abusing you is the person to actually sign off if you're to get you know an extension uh a next contract so it was quite uh, uh i spent i think half of the year in that place crying with my friends Aww. and it was terrible I'm and so that's sorry. how violent mm. it is and you don't it's so insidious because uh someone will ask you so what was 
that one thing the person it's not one thing mm-hmm. someone yelling at you people when systems are white systems mm-hmm. s- set up um as what we call the white industrial complex right now mm-hmm. to it's like you are the good white people trying to save these black people and then when you're a black person in that system it's a whole different experience yeah but but it was top level sexist racist abuse um, that actually the very system has no mechanism of even addressing yeah i i agree um i'm remembering one of a campaign you were involved in a push for Stella Nyanzi mm-hmm. uh, you came out publicly and really supported Stella during her court case on uh, cyber harassment mm-hmm. and offensive communication At that time she had published a poem in 2019 condemning the president president Museveni mm-hmm. um and in an article you wrote about one of her court appearances you mentioned a moment where the magistrate suggested that she should take a seat um it it might be it, it, she was standing and you know stella she decided no i'm going to keep standing so she says i'm going to keep standing i'll stand for all women mm-hmm. could you talk about why this statement from stella really resonated with you and put it in context of you know the movement and w- where where women were at that time in Uganda i covered uh, a lot uh, of court sessions for that case and um, in in that moment remember the magistrate was a woman mm-hmm. who was presiding over this case and of course she was often shocked out of her system because this is this is you know these are poems that you have to put up in the courtroom and have to be read loudly yeah And when you show the evidence yeah. yes this is the evidence yeah. you're dealing with at your hand so often the court sessions were long so i think he had taken like five hours and stella is standing mm-hmm. as an accused in the dock and and then at some point the magistrate sort of having mercy on stella says um i think stella should have a seat it's fine you can have a seat and Stella was about to take a seat in the magistrate ads especially you know she's a woman it was like i'm sure she knew that this is not something you tell stella and it is against all her politics to because you have mercy on her because she's a woman does that mean if you if there was another person in that dock it's challenges on so many levels mm-hmm. so another human being you're supposed to treat them you know how mm-hmm. but also um like quietly saying like she's weak because she's a woman. Yes, yes. And Stella said I'm not. Thank you. Let's continue. And that was a very very powerful moment saying I'm going to stand up for myself and for the women that you think are weak. Mm-hmm. And if that's you know is like of course she was not actually in a very good he- health but she actually resisted with all her life. Stella's resistance as, as you're covering it as we are witnessing it it's you know as you're saying it's multifaceted and it's uh trying to challenge people to think about power and these structures very differently in ways that maybe they usually resist or are afraid of thinking about them what do you think it's doing for young women young queer activists right now i think it's very important to have a visible ally in a country where a few years ago you had a law that was calling for death penalty for lgbtq ugandans mm. so having somebody consistent and afraid putting these issues in any movement that is against oppression has to look at all types of oppression mm. you know so she brings that good voice of checking different people whether it's the men is uh, men in the movement mm. she challenges them mm. because uh we are not oppressed the same as a woman and a man you know we are not oppressed the same when the when the country systems break down we don't suffer the same way mm. when you come from a country where 14 people uh, 14 women die every day to, due to pregnancy complications for a life of a woman in a country it means at some point you'll almost die yeah. and that's not something a man in our country will 
ever have to contend with so i think that she brings that analysis to the to 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 her challenge to the to the status quo and say yes we have to be open and also you know bring in other people that are marginalized like queer ugandans mm-hmm. you know like they are ugandans they have the same right as you while a typical mainstream opposition person would not support lgbtr rights in our country yeah uh rosabel we um you know you're doing a lot of work you're really busy i'm so glad you had the time to even come and chat i saw that during the pandemic you were chilling in the village i was really following your instagram and you were making this really beautiful baskets so I just wanted to hear more about your self care and how you take care of yourself amidst all you know facing these stories and these issues mm-hmm. every day which can be super draining when the when the pandemic hit in Uganda and we reported up first case um I was I, I was born in the village I love I love being out in the countryside and being with my parents mm-hmm. my my relatives i for me that is where my roots are mm-hmm. even when people say are you from kampala i'm like no i live in kampala but i'm not from there mm-hmm. i'm from somewhere else you know that's where my roots are that's where people i know have seen me young and you know uh, know a lot about me so i knew that i didn't want to, fa- to this to be a situation where um in an apartment in a city in stuck mm-hmm. so i was able to stay with my mom and my aunties and then in one of the conversation was like what do we do you know we are idle we need to do something mm-hmm. then my mom knows how to weave baskets very well and my aunties were like let's let's continue, let's do this you know um so then we started i had not actually attempted to weave a basket since i was probably like 9 years old because we used to do those, those things in school work hand mm. work in mm. school in in, uh, in my area so so actually uh, we started a basket weaving a basket is like so addictive you know <laughs> once you wake up and you touch it like you touch you the basket stop. you can't stop people just say oh lunch time mm. and if you want like to finish the basket like you can actually say i don't want lunch i need to finish this <laughs> so it's very therapeutic it's like makes you focused mm. like it's like the world is not existing basically. it's like a meditation kind of yes yeah. and also like the weaving is good socially so my aunties would come and we'll sit and and do together and share stories and mm-hmm. so in that you know you're able to connect with people differently in a way i would not have connected with them if yeah. we didn't go back and we made so many baskets by the time i was coming back to kampala after six months we had many baskets so i, I started selling for them ah. <laughs> yeah then until actually until like Christmas time they also made so many baskets and I'd put them on my Instagram yes. and send send people to deliver them and they did they did really um it helped them a lot because you know everybody is work was on hold mm. you know and a lot of older women of course even if in the rural area like you depend on your farm they don't have problems with food but money was nowhere to be seen you know um you've talked about lots of interesting things you're doing Where can someone see your work? Where can they find you on social media, online, anywhere? Well, um you can find me on Twitter at @rosebelk. And if you're tired of arguments, <laughs> you can find me on Instagram, you know, where I I like to retreat to Instagram just mm-hmm. You know, easy life. I love fashion. I love other things. Yes. Um, By the way, I should have started with <laughs> Rosebel's fashion is amazing. But continue. Yeah, but you know, often like we started with how people want to put in a box. So mm-hmm. often when I meet people, they think they expect like a very big woman with a very big presence, <laughs> and I disappoint many often. <laughs> but but also like. when you're a woman in the space and you're articulating these issues people tend to think you have no life yes <laughs> or they think that this is the only life you live so mm-hmm. people are always shocked to see my to see this other side i'm like you know we are very multifaceted people yeah. many things in one day yeah, you yeah. know you step out you go and enjoy life mm-hmm. however you can find it mm-hmm. you know um You've been listening to Power of the Streets, a podcast series brought to you by Human Rights Watch. I'm Audrey Kawire Wabwire. That's the end of our show. 
Check out our show notes for more about Rosebell and her work at African Feminism. In the next episode, we take the conversation to Gambia. To learn more about Human Rights Watch, visit hrw.org and follow us on Twitter at HRW and on Instagram at Human Rights Watch for updates about the show. Join the conversation using the hashtag Power of the Streets and share your thoughts with Rosebell or any of our other guests. And you can tell us how you're speaking truth to power. Our producer is Andy Siwe and this is a volume production. The main theme song, Au Revoir, is produced by Young OG Beats. Till next time, thank you for listening.